I've um, tried to show you the that um, let's go back to this example before actually on the, the conjugate gradient. So we're looking at sparse linear system solving again. And we let's just do a relatively small scale system, say a thousand in dimensional inputs and say a hundred data points. So that's pretty easy to do. And we're going to do it by both methods again. So this is the, um, the first one was the, uh, using the fact that we can actually sort of uh, not define the A matrix. And the second one was doing it through the A matrix definition. So in this case, the A matrix is only 1,000 by 1,000. So that's kind of doable. Uh, you see, you can, you can run OK. Um, the other thing I wanted to say, maybe I didn't emphasize enough before, is that, so formally speaking, uh, as we remember from last time, the number of updates that's, re that's required for conjugate gradients to get to the absolute optimum of the function is at most d in this case, right? So you would expect then, certainly within d updates, conjugate gradient updates, to get to the actual global optimum. But we got to the global optimum in four updates. So often things are not so bad. So this, you know. D is the, is the worst case analysis. In practice, your data somehow lives typically on a kind of lower dimensional subspace in some sense, so that the solution doesn't really require all the dimensions really to, to the, the space. And you can often get there much more quickly. That's another reason why people quite like these uh, kind of gradient-based techniques. It's only these conjugate gradient methods that are very, very powerful. And there are, you know, there are, there are extensions of these kind of things. You know, this, this conjugate gradient is just like the, the starting point, really, this whole area of, uh, of uh, techniques. So, uh, OK. So let's look at a slightly bigger problem. Let's say there are 10,000 uh, inputs. Uh, I suspect this will now crash my computer. So that's the training data. So we're going to run again the first one. This is not defined in a matrix, so that runs fine. Again, we're converged in four updates. Uh, we'll add a memory, basically, the second one. So you can imagine, though, this is not just um, yeah, it's a small network, but there's no way you can do this in general. It's, uh, it's quadratically bad. So the other thing to say uh, before we finish this is that, of course, I, I did this for linear regression, but there's nothing to stop you doing this for um, Say logistic regression, right? Right? How would it work for logistic regression? So let's take your example, your Tesco customers. A hundred thousand products. Somehow Tesco decides this is a good or a bad customer. Uh, this one makes us lots of money. This one doesn't make us lots of money. We like this customer, we don't like that one. And they want to they want to try to figure out whether or not you're a good customer based upon your buying patterns. Right. I don't know, I guess they do that kind of stuff, right? So maybe you could implement an SVM or um, maybe a logistic regression. And let's say we've got sparse data. So I claim that you can do the same thing here as um, but for that logistic regression case, as we're doing, as we're doing here, how how would you do that? We have gradients there. Yeah. So can we remember what it looks like? Should we go through it? Mathematically, at least. This would make a great uh, sorry. Um, maybe this would make a great assignment actually. <coughs> I think about it. Okay, so I think it works like this. I haven't actually done it myself, but just uh, I don't see any reason why it shouldn't work. Um, so we, we, let's imagine we want to do maximum likelihood training. Uh, so what does the maximum likelihood look like? So we're going to have sum over the data points, right? We're going to have log of the class cn times by, let's just say, very simple, w transpose xn. So W is going to be the parameter vector in this case, and C is going to be the class label, and I'm going to make that uh, plus or minus one. So 
Okay, so C is uh, plus one or minus one, and sigma is our usual sigmoid function of x plus e to the x, right? Everyone's happy with that, hopefully. So this is our objective function, uh, in this case, um, e, w. And if we want to, we want to maximize that, so you know, if you want to do a gradient descent, we'll put a minus sign just to make it a, a minimization. <coughs> So, what is the gradient? Well, it's the sums <coughs> CN, WTX, and it's going to be. Let's do, let's do this one first. It's going to be the log, gradient of the log is 1 over the log, right? So, 1 over sigma. That's so the derivative of the sigma sigma the function. The derivative of the sigma the function it turns out to be sigma as by one minus sigma. That's just that's, uh, what happens in this case. And then we've got the derivative of this thing inside, so that's going to be C n times by um, x. Let's just do the whole thing. So in other words, this is just um, minus C's cancel, C's cancel, so it's uh, minus sum of n over uh, one minus sigma in the function of Cn W transpose the uh, Xn times by sigma Xn. Good. Okay, so the point is that Conjugate gradients. What does it require to to to, to do to you know, to go along? It requires two things. It requires a, a gradient, right? And it requires that we can do line search efficiently along some direction. So and then the gradient is is good because look, uh, it's the same as before, right? Basically. If you've got a large number of data points here, and let's say they're sparse again, okay, well the gradient is going to be just some, this is the inner product again between the w and the x, which again is going to be fast to do. Okay, so there's some nonlinear function out here, but that's just a nonlinear function on a vector, so that's okay, right? That's uh, storage costs are, are low. And then again, as before, this is exactly the kind of things where it's just proportional to some uh, x term. Okay, so that again would be advantageous if x were sparse. So it's the same, the complexity of computing this is the same as before, this gradient. So that's good. Um, the, the line search, well that will require that we can search along a particular line. So what that would mean is that we parameterize the line by w is equal to uh, our current point, say let's say uh, w, whatever it is, uh, we should call it. Let's say w zero where we're currently at, plus some lambda along the conjugate direction p, where this p is what's being defined for us from as the conjugate direction from the polyac rubier formula. Okay, and that's fine because when you look at this, well, when we pl place this in here, then we're only going to get scalar products between these vectors and these x's again. So what that means is that this is a as a function of lambda, it's very easy to compute. It only requires the scalar products again between x and fixed vectors. So that means you can then numerically find, do a line search along a direction easily. So that means that you can compute, you can do one uh, conjugate gradient updates in essentially the same kind of uh, complexity as we did for linear regression. Okay. So that's, uh, that's fine. What's not guaranteed, of course, though, is the so this case, um, the logistic regression, it's it's a convex function, okay. So that's that's good. It's got a unique optimum, but it's not a quadratic function. So it doesn't mean that we can find the optimum in you know most say n times uh, n conjugate updates or deconjugate updates. It could take more. So we, you would you would anticipate that in this case, things won't work maybe quite as well as in the in the, in the linear regression case. But it should not be too bad. Okay, so remember that 
the standard philosophy for formulating these uh, optimization routines is to start, they're formulated by the requirement that they should solve the quadratic form case well. And then you just generalize the algorithm to the general case. So here, it works, you can implement it again, and it, and it will work, but it will not work as well as where the algorithm was designed to work well, which is the quadratic form case. <coughs> so that means you can now, you know, you, you can do your Tesco stuff um, uh, quickly, but the, if you wanted to do it this way, you could do it that way. Um, so if you've got, uh, you know, many, many, um, many customers, you have to remember that in this case, you still going to be the gradient. If you do it the way we were talking about before, you know, you're going to have to sum over each time. You have to, you have to sum all explicitly over all your customers. This is a little bit uh, more complicated. In this case, actually, there's no, um, there's no choice but to do it that way. You cannot do it the, the, conjugate, the, the other way where we define the A matrix. So in this case, there's no A matrix. You cannot, because of the nonlinearity, you cannot sort of bring this and sort of bring these x's together and then get rid of the sum over n. Do a pre-computation. That doesn't work here. So you anyway have to do it this way. But it's fast. I guess you could do all kinds, you know, Taylor expansions or something, but to sort of approximately linearize it. So there you go. Oh, it will make uh, quite a nice, um, quite a nice exercise. Maybe I'll give you that as part of the assignment. So maybe you can then do training of a, you know, hundred thousand dimensional uh, support vector machine or logistic regression or something. Like that. Okay. So now. I was going to show you uh, something completely new. So then, what I want to show you is you may, you may have heard of this thing. I don't know, but this uh, it's called Julia. the Julia language is a pretty new thing. Um, so I, I like MATLAB. That's cool, right? You can do lots of things. The reason I like MATLAB is because it's close to the mathematics. It's the closest thing to linear algebra that, that's out there. So the syntax is very nice. Uh, what's not nice about MATLAB is that you have to pay for it. So I don't like that. And I think it's kind of, uh, it's not, not great that a standard thing in, you know, in the, the world becomes uh, something that's not free. It would be kind of very strange to have to pay for C or C++, but we pay for MATLAB. So, um, I'm very hopeful. Um, I've been waiting for a long time for something like Julia to arrive. I even uh, was thinking of trying to do it myself uh, last year to start a project, but um, thank goodness somebody else managed to, to start this. And this is uh, pretty much exactly what I've always wanted, which is a language which is pretty, pretty much as fast to C as you can get. There's no major performance uh, drop-off. Um, and it's got the syntax of MATLAB. So if you're a MATLAB programmer, so uh, you can start some programming pretty much straight away. So it uh, comes out of MIT, three, guy, three, four guys there. These guys are like parallel computing guys mainly, um, but they know a lot about large da scale data analysis. And um, I'm not going to explain a lot about Julia now. It's like I said, it's super, it's super new, so don't expect things to work very well. But I, I wanted to tell you about it because I think this is the future, or close to the future. So this is uh, some performance benchmarks on some test cases here. Uh, so I don't know, maybe these are, I shouldn't read too much into this stuff, but it's just maybe marginally interesting. So you can do things like, um, So let's say this one bottom one here, right? So this is a matrix, a random matrix multiplication problem. I think you just have a large matrix, up to large matrices, and you just multiply them together, right? Uh, so MATLAB is optimized for this, so that's uh, that's fine. So this this um, Julia is uh, this is compared to I think uh, I don't remember the, what 
what it's compared to actually some kind of C or something like that. So if it's one, it's doing as well as C or something like that. <coughs> if it's two, it's, as, it's twice as slow as C or something like that. That makes sense. Yeah, relative to C. Oh, relative to C. Yeah, sorry. So, um, so these, you know, these are doing fine. Julia's doing fine. But you look at some other stuff, like some things with you know four next loops, like the Fibonacci uh, series. And the lab is terrible. Um, the octave is a total disaster. This thing is just sorting. It's like yeah, it's just yeah, this is unusable. But the R is. It's just terrible. Actually. JavaScript is surprisingly quick. JavaScript, that's, yeah. That's the future. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Apparently, I don't know much about this, but I, I think this JavaScript, this V8 version, is something that Google have been uh, involved with. So it's kind of Google optimized uh, JavaScript. So it's true. It's true that that's yeah, that's pretty impressive. Yeah. Um, but you shouldn't read a huge amount into these numbers. Of course, there may be things where you know. Don't things don't work as well as the, they they might be suggesting. But I think what's interesting is that you know it, it's it's a motivating thing. I think it's it's kind of exciting that you can uh, you know you can do uh, much better than MATLAB with something which is looking like MATLAB. Um, now uh, there are some um, things I don't like about it. It's a little bit Python esque. I don't know much about Python, but there are some weird indexing things going on in Python which I find. Uh, completely incomprehensible myself and unfortunately they seem to have uh, carried over through to uh, through to Julia. Um, one great thing for me at least is that they don't do zero indexing, they do one indexing in Julia, which I prefer a lot because mathematics starts from one, not from zero. Um, so that's nice. Um, another interesting thing for today is that you can do parallel programming with uh, Julia. Okay, so this is kind of fun. I know, I know you can do it with MATLAB, but you have to buy yet another thing, which is in this case, you have to buy some kind of parallel computing toolbox. And I don't have that myself. So, um, uh, yeah, so maybe I'll just show you um, some uh, demo code for parallel programming. There. Um, I should say, you know, you feel free to try and download this thing and install it. It's available for a variety of operating systems, but it's it doesn't work well on the Windows. So I installed it on the Windows and none of the parallel computing things are uh, they they're not really working there. And this thing is not even it's it's, it's, not, it's uh, you know is it version zero point one or something like that. We're nowhere close yet, I think, to actually releasing or they are nowhere close to releasing the, the version one. I think it's gonna be a few months at least. Um, but it does it does work. There's no there's no real graphics there, so it's a little bit like C yet, but it will, it's coming. So everything that we want will be will be here. So I'm keen to promote this thing. I just really haven't got it already. Um, what do you think is the chance that it will actually kind of become? Similar? I think it's very high, actually. Yeah, I'm I'm hoping and expecting it to to replace MATLAB in the next uh, three years. Uh, I mean, personally, I will. Um, if things go well with this, I will ditch MATLAB completely within probably a year. I'm hoping for it. Does that mean you rewrite in the BRML toolbox? It would, yeah. But or somebody else would, would do that. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, well, yeah. Maybe it's not the most exciting PhD project. <laughs> okay, so I installed it on, my, on the Windows, but it, yeah, it didn't work. But then I, I installed it on Ubuntu, and it did work. Um, so this, this is working on Ubuntu 10, uh, 12.10. Um, I have to say, it wasn't super easy to install, <laughs> but I did get it to install. Uh, it's not quite as um, you know as simple as you, you would like it to be, but it's, it's doable. So, um, so Julia looks like, uh, you know, it's the usual kind of thing, right? I mean, I don't know a lot about this kind of stuff, but, you know, it's just a standard kind of uh, Unix thing. So this is Julia. Now, uh, what's interesting here is we're going to start the Julia process with uh, one processor, in this case, minus P1. It means that we're just going to use, in this case, one of the cores on this uh, little laptop, okay? I think there are four cores on this laptop. 
Um, and I'm going to just uh, call it initially with one core. Okay. Uh, what's interesting is that you can very easily extend this to uh, cloud computing or to uh, a cluster as well. It's quite straightforward, actually. You just need to make sure that you've got SSH uh, password-free login and, uh, to your, your cluster nodes, and you can then just dis uh, distribute this over the, the cluster as well. I haven't done that myself, but I just want to show you that it will work at least over your own local machine. You can distribute over your cores on your machine uh, very easily. Do you know if it plugs into GPUs? Yeah. Um, I don't know about that. I doubt they should do that. You think it did it the second one? No, I don't know, but they should. <laughs> and they should do that. Yeah, well, yeah, I, yeah. I don't know. I don't okay. Know. okay, so let's uh, let's start Julia. Actually, MATLAB does that. Mm. It has a few books. Mm. That's good I like that. Okay, so this is Julia, and uh, I'll just show you what a, a typical kind of Julia program looks like. So this this is linear regression in Julia. So uh, the point is that this should look very familiar to us now. This is like MATLAB style syntax, you know. So there's some, you know. Um, I'm going to make some W is going to be the training, the, uh, the parameter vector. So it's going to be, I'm going to make some fake training data to start with. I'm going to, so W is a random d dimensional vector. X is going to be some uh, matrix of data. And Y is going to be our training regression output. So I go through the data, you know, I just say the nth uh, column is just some random data point. The Y uh, sort of index, the Y training thing is to say the scalar product between these things plus some random noise. There's some weird indexing stuff you have to do, unfortunately, with, uh, with Julia. Don't ask me why this uh, is required. It's beyond me. Um, it seems to be beyond many uh, sort of posters on the various fora as well, so I don't know what's going on. Maybe if you're a Python person, it, it all seems very clear to you, but it's not clear to me. Okay, so then um, what I'm going to do here is you know, you know, I'm going to do this. I'm not claiming this is a very interesting program, by the way. I just want to show you the parallel computing aspects of it. I'm going to solve it by the way of defining the A matrix and the B matrix. Okay, so this is the, the bad way of doing it. I'm not doing it the sophisticated way. I'm just going to define the A matrix, define the B vector, and then I'm just going to solve the corresponding linear system A backslash B. Okay, so this is a, maybe a bad thing to do, but. Um, so the lambda is 3.1. Um, <coughs> so we're going to start uh, with A to be lambda times by the identity matrix, and B is a zero vector. And then we're going to construct just by this A matrix by summing up the outer products of the data vectors. Okay. So what I'm going to do though is I want to show you that there's this command, for example, the parallel four command in, in Julia. Okay. So this will parallelize this operation over however many processes are available. Um, and then we'll, uh, we'll have done that thing, and I'll do a sort of corresponding parallel for loop over this thing, and I'll add this thing, and it will, it will sum them up. So the, the, the operation, I guess is a kind of like a map reduce style thing, but basically the, the operation which will be performed is the plus. So each of this is distributed over the processes, and they'll be reduced through this plus operation. So this is the parallel for and reduction. Okay. And similarly for, for B. And then once we've when we've got these things, we can just we can get the solution, say W I out is just A divided by B, which is the same backslash operation that we use in MATLAB to solve the linear system A is equal to B. And uh, then I compute the mean square area, which is just the sum of you know my y minus x transpose times w out uh, squared, and we can then just uh, figure out how many seconds that took. Okay, so I'm going to I'm going to run this. It would take a little a few a few seconds because I, I need to do it on a system which is large enough that you see some effect of the parallelization. Otherwise, if things are too small, it will kind of like all look the same. So. Uh, 
let's just uh, run this thing. So if I remember how to do it, you have to load it first. So in this case, there are oh, this case first. So it's very small, just a hundred dimensional inputs. There are a hundred thousand training things. So I'm parallelizing some of the data points, but in this case, there's only one core. So actually, there's not really doing it. There's no parallelization going on. Um, it's just that one on the same core. So I think this will take about 40 seconds or something like that to do this parallel sum. <coughs> so to do it, to do this sum on, on one processor. So it did a sum and then it's now just on the solution, just solved the linear system. Okay, so it took about 40, 44 seconds, something like that, over on one processor. So let's quit uh, Julia and then start it, say, uh, with a couple more cores. So I guess if I run. If we run top at the same time, maybe it would be interesting to see what's going on with that. Let me think of that. Okay, so let's do the loading. So you can see Julia is now on the top. It's taking pretty much 100% of the CPU of the three processors. Okay, so it's distributing the this thing. So if it's working really well, of course it will be, you know, a factor of uh, one over three times as. Uh, the, the speed. So this system took, uh, you know, wasn't quite. It was 29 seconds. So that's not as the speed of you would perhaps hope for. Um, but it's, you know, it's faster than 44. So it's kind of, uh, it's kind of good. But so these things are, um, you know, the performance of this is, is still fluctuating as they're developing the language and you depend upon your processes, etc. But you can see that, you know, if you've got say something with, uh, you know, you've got a machine with. Uh, the PC's got you know twelve cores, and it's very very easy to to exploit that. This. And what's interesting there actually is that I didn't change the code at all. Right, it's exactly the same code, and it's no difference. So I just uh, just called it with a different number of processes for Julia to use. So that's great, right? So that's why I, I'm quite excited about this kind of stuff because I think you can then do this kind of high level parallel computing uh, cheaply without having to worry about the low level stuff like message passion between various processes, which is fun, but it's kind of, it's highly dynamic, you know, which languages are, you know, the way to do it is highly dependent on, you know, what, what sort of processes you're using and, you know, uh, whatever, you know, um, the Amazon thing was all the rage last year and nobody really likes it anymore and, yeah, it's like, it's really, uh, it's really painful development stuff, so. This is nice. So feel free to um, you know use Julia perhaps if you're interested to to try it if you want to speed up your your processes or your you know to find solutions to some of your cool problems. Any questions on Julia? So those of you who are uh, you know good developers, I mean you may want to try and help these guys to to make this whole thing better. You can just down download the whole thing. It's all on uh, GitHub. So feel free to, to give these guys a hand, basically, to get this thing up and running as, uh, as, as quickly as we can. We need, we need this. Do you know if it has any machine learning algorithms already built? Um, not yet, but um, the guys who are doing it um, are also interested in machine learning. So okay. they, 
they are one of them is a, like a, I think a parallel computing uh, guy and another, another I think the other two are kind of large scale data analysis okay. guys so they are very familiar with the problems that we would have mm -hmm. but there's maybe an opportunity there maybe you can write a toolbox for uh, you know, some kind of machine learning stuff mm -hmm. um, like I say I mean some things don't work well so you know uh, it, it doesn't work for some reason <coughs> It runs on the Windows, this parallel thing, but it has no speed up, so I don't know what's going on there. So things are, and there are some other sort of you know, slightly suboptimal things at the moment, but yeah, I think this is really, really amazing stuff. Cool. Any more questions on Julia? No. Um, could we run a, maybe a simulation and compare it with MATLAB on one core? Uh, we could. I don't have MATLAB installed on Ubuntu, unfortunately. Um, but we could try. Um, what kind of we can run over? We can well, it's yeah. The same thing, just with the same parameters, maybe. Yeah, uh, you can do. Th I actually, I did. I did do that. Um, it'll take a little while to run it here. It's about. Actually, Julia is about the same as MATLAB in terms of just the on one core. Yeah, it's a little bit faster. In my life, but it's about the same. And this kind of thing here is not particularly difficult because MATLAB also attempts to parallelize or to vectorize the. If so, if you, if you, even if you write a for next loop, it attempts to vectorize it in some way or you know, kind of. It has this kind of, kind of compiler which does some sort of fancy stuff. So it depends a little bit what you do, but I, I think that I ran essentially this and. I found that Julia was a little bit faster, even if just running on a single core. Um, certainly, if you've got anything a little bit more fancy with you know, more sort of nest of four next, four next loops and things like that, then Julia will, will easily be my lab. So, much, much faster. so, I think, you know, there's no. I think I'm hoping that within the next few months there'll be no reason not to use uh, Julia. It's, uh, Great. offending nearly all of you, I'm going to very rapidly just go through this. I know you know all of this already, but there may be something. So we're going to skip through this, okay? Uh, but there may be some useful things to, to say. So, uh, so supervised learning, you know what that's all about, hopefully. Um, so we we can think about this as uh, you know, we're given some input x, and we basically Maybe uh, want to have some output of some y or some class c, and we want to figure out you know, how to to do that. So one thing we have to do is have to define the loss or the utility of actually our predictions. So uh, in that case, you know, maybe I can use a u function here. So uh, what we might do is say we have some utility. If c, for example, in classification problem is a true class, and c pred is the predicted class, then we've got some utility function which tells us how useful it is to make this, uh, say, uh, error or to get the true class predicted correctly. Okay, so maybe you might say, well, then uh, you might have some kind of expected utility, right? So in this case, maybe you might sum over all of the, the sort of the, the labels from your classifier and what is the utility, so the predicted probability from your classifier, given X star, you predict a certain uh, class for the prediction, and the expected utility would be the average of the utility respective to those two uh, predictions. And then you might say, well, you know, the optimal prediction is the one which, say, maximizes the utility. Right? So this is something that you've already done in supervised learning. Okay, so in some sense, the, um, the, the main thing that we have to do in supervised learning is kind of learn about this function P of C and X. Uh, just one thing I want to say <coughs> is that, okay, you know, the, the classic thing we do is uh, use the zero one utility. So the 
utility is uh, one if you get predict the correct class, otherwise you don't kind of get anything, zero. In that case, in this uh, probabilistic setting, the optimal classifier will be the one that you predict, say, class one, if the probability being class one is bigger than 0 0.5, otherwise you predict class two. So this is all interesting stuff. And in general, if there's some general utility function, and you can have a utility matrix, for example, the probability for more than two classes uh, of you know, predicting the true classes I. Um, sorry, given the, if the true class is I and you and you predict the probability of class is J, then you might have some utility function for there. And we define a utility matrix. And again, you can think about the expected utility as well, and the class which gives rise to the highest expected utility. Squared loss, that's what we've been doing in linear regression. Uh, this is the empirical distribution. Okay, so this is something we've been talking about before. So in this case, the simplest way to go about accessing this probability in this expected utility framework is to say, well, my probability of the class labels and the date and uh, the x given the data of God is just, I just place a point mass on each of the data points and the corresponding classes. So that would be the corresponding empirical distribution. And in this case, the expected utility is just given by the sum of the data points of the empirical uh, losses or empirical uh, utilities or empirical loss. And this is called the empirical risk. If you use, you know, rather than using a utility function, if you prefer to call it, let's say, a loss function, maybe that's the negative utility, for example, then you'd have a, you'd have a sort of an expected risk. Uh, an empirical risk. Okay, so you've done with John, what you did with, with um, who did you do this with? It was uh, in supervised learning, I forgot who your lecturer is this year. Is, who's it Mark again? Mark and Messi. Yeah. Mark and Messi. So you did the, you did the empirical um, risk minimization procedure, and that's what this is. Okay, so you can also parameterize uh, this as well, right? So you can now say, well, you know, I can make some sort of function, um, some classifier, uh, which depends upon some parameters theta, and, and I'm going to new input x. So for example, linear regression might say something like, well, you know, if, uh, if this, say, this linear function, p transpose x plus some offset is bigger than zero, and also plus one, otherwise I can spot this two. So that would be, another way to do that, you can plug that parametric form into your risk function and this gives you then some function of the parameter theta which you optimize. Yeah, so maybe I just skip through all this actually. It's just a penalize of the risk. Um, so this graphic is trying to say, you know, what, what's going on with empirical risk thing is that you first of all take your data set, in this case your inputs on your class labels, and you form some distribution from, of that. In this case, it's the empirical distribution. Okay, it's a function of the input data. And for a given parameter, theta, you basically, given these two things, you can, f you can figure out what the empirical risk is. This is your objective function. And then you'll minimize this objective function, so it's your expected loss, plus maybe some penalty term. And then you get this optimal theta, and then you basically say, well, OK, I just plug this now, given a new x star, I just figure out what is the optimal class label <coughs> given by what is this discriminant function of x given this optimal parameter theta. So this is the kind of the, the overview, if you like, of the empirical loss uh, approach, or empirical risk approach. Okay. So that's, uh, that's nice. Yeah, there's some um, small things I want just to say which may not have been discussed in supervised learning. So one thing to think about a little bit is you know, why do people care about this uh, quadratic penalty function? So we often see that, you know, we, we add on the squared length of the parameter vector. So one way to think about that, maybe not a particularly great way to think about it, but let's take, say, the linear regression case or the, say, this, this uh, in the perceptron case, right? So if there, in that case, the you know the decision boundaries given by this linear function theta transpose x plus maybe some offset. So if you've got two inputs x one and x two, okay, then what's the difference in this this function here? Well, if delta is the difference between these two inputs, 
uh, difference in this the, the the square difference in this function here is given by this expression now. Right. So in other words, it's just theta transpose times by the difference between the two x's, and it's just squared. Right? That's the how much the, the, the squared length that's going to change in the scalar function is going to be for two different inputs, x1 and x2. Okay. So what you want, basically, is that essentially when, um, when we, for sort of, on average, you want change, for changes in the inputs not to have too big a change in the output. In some sense, like, if you had got, you were, if you were two positions in space, okay, which were uh, close together, x1 and x2, then you want the corresponding function, which the discriminative discriminat function depends upon, you want that not to change that rapidly, if the, or not to be too different if the x1 and x2 are close. If the x1 and x2 are far apart, maybe the discriminant function could change a lot, right? But the argument of the discriminant function should be similar for two inputs which are close together. So that's a kind of smoothness criterion which you can, you can uh, apply. So if the change in the, the function, or the difference between the, the, and the, and the discriminant function's argument is given by this for x1 and x2, let's consider the case when this delta actually, this difference is, say, some random amount, but it's kind of controlled. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, well, let's imagine that this delta is actually self-drawn from, say, a Gaussian distribution, so an isotropic Gaussian, okay, with uh, variance given by sigma squared. Okay, so I'm going to say that these differences between the inputs are small. So what I want then is this argument of the discriminant function itself not to change too much. So let's compute the expected change for having these differences drawn from this sort of Gaussian distribution. Okay, what would that be? So the expectation of this squared change in this, the argument of the discriminant function is then given by, you can work this out, this amount here, sigma squared, times by theta times plus theta. So because we, we don't want this to be big, this uh, this, squared, this change, right, this then motivates why theta transpose theta for fixed sigma should be small. That's why we want to penalize the squared length of theta transpose theta. So what that would mean is that on average, you know, by penalizing theta to be small, the length of theta to be small, we will not have that big a change in the argument of the discriminant function as we have for two inputs which are close together. And that's basically what we would like. That's a smoothness requirement. Just out of interest, by the way, um, you can all compute that, right? That's the thing, hopefully. How do we how do how do we get this expression from here to here? Do something like that. Yeah, so it's kind of an interesting. Ah. Okay, so uh, what is this thing? So it's the integral of e to the minus, I'm going to call this delta x, just call it delta. Okay, just for notational simplicity. So it's a delta squared, right, over 2 sigma squared. So that's the expectation with respect to this distribution of this quantity here, so theta <coughs> transposed delta square d delta. So that's the integral that we require to, to carry out over all real space. So we had a kind of suggestion before. Any other 
any other suggestions how to compute that integral? Theta is constant. So. Theta is constant, that's true. That's true. So we get on the integration and, that, and we'll get to the variance of the new delta? <coughs> yeah, that's true. But we need to, if it were a scalar, if, if theta and delta were scalars, we could do exactly what you're saying. But they are vectors, right? So we can't quite do, we can't, we want to do something like you say, but we have to make sure we do it correctly because we're in the n-dimensional, we're in the d-dimensional case here. So you're right, so, so your point is that you know, e to the minus, if delta were a scalar, it's this, right? 2 pi sigma squared here, the square root of that, uh, times by delta theta squared, d delta. And you could say, well, this is equal to we say theta is a constant, so that's indeed theta squared times by the integral uh, of theta minus delta squared over 2 sigma squared times by delta squared. And this is indeed by definition, this is the variance of the of delta, so that's just equal to sigma squared. That's true. So that's good, but that's the scalar case, right? Work out the square theta transpose delta delta transpose theta. Yes. Okay. Great. So let's go this way. Uh, so let's write this as the integral of minus delta squared. transposed delta let's say d to transpose delta d, d delta and now I could say rewrite that one as say um, delta transpose theta also okay. And I could also rearrange it. I could say let's switch those two around. So it's say theta transpose delta, delta transpose theta. That's also okay. And now this is um, interesting because this is like a matrix. So this is theta transpose some matrix here. M <coughs> times by theta. Right. But now you can um, use the fact that theta is independent of delta and bring it inside. So you can write this and say this is equal to the integral. Of, so it's theta transposed. The integral minus infinity over all real space delta squared over 2 sigma squared 2 pi sigma squared of d over 2 right so delta delta transposed minus by theta d d delta okay now what You made the observation that this term here, this is the variance of delta, right? So the question, I guess, now is what is what is this term here? This is the analogous term, right? What what is that in this case? Yeah. Is so the result of that will be the matrix of diagonal matrices equal to six squared and zero when it's absolutely yeah. taking. Yeah. So actually, this, by definition, this is the the covariance. 
matrix right, for a zero mean Gaussian. And I said that the covariance matrix was sigma squared times by the energy matrix, so I have defined it that way. So that means we put sigma squared I, the I in there, the I is then going to give us, you know, uh, theta transpose I times theta, which is just theta transpose theta. So it's going to be sigma squared theta transpose Great. Okay, so that's kind of a partial justification for using squared penalty loss. Okay, validation, you know about that, training and testing, etc. Um to data into the validation and training set. Maybe have a separate test set to get some kind of uh, error. The cross validation, you you know, you split your training and your validation data different ways, you know, training set, etc. So you've done all this stuff, so I won't uh, bore you with that. I just want to maybe just point out some of the distinctions between this and other ways of doing it. So the good thing about this empirical risk approach is that if you've got a lot of data, then the empirical distribution, the, the everything this depends upon is the empirical distribution, okay, in some sense. So the, um, that empirical distribution will tend towards the true data distribution, the distribution of the data was truly generated. So that's good. So your, your decision, so given that you're, you've, you've, you know, you've got a reasonable discriminant function, then the, the setting of the parameters of that discriminant function will be asymptotically good because you're setting them on the basis of the true data generating mechanism as you get lots and lots of data. So in that sense, the, um, it's a kind of very easily justifiable procedure. It's nice. And if you've got lots of data, it will, it will work well. There are some potential drawbacks to this empirical risk approach. Uh, it's pretty, you know, it's pretty extreme to say, well, I'm going to use the empirical distribution as my data, my distribution for the data. I mean, we, you don't really believe that that's the, the you know, the data generating mechanism. You've only got you know, a few data points. Approximating your data generating mechanism by the empirical distribution for those few data points seems kind of extreme somehow. You know, maybe you would expect it to be broader, and maybe you get other data points than the just the empirical distribution, right? Maybe other things could happen. So that sounds that seems kind of weird. Um, that's the drawback, conceptual drawback. If you change the loss function, you you need to retrain the whole thing, right? You need to get the you need to retrain the discriminant function. There's no obvious confidence or um, measures of confidence in the solution, which is offered by this empirical uh, risk minimization procedure. Um, yeah, so maybe if you've got many penalty parameters, then performing cross-validation is fancy, maybe that's a little bit less, less of a serious issue. But, um, another kind of a little bit strange thing is that when you do validation, in principle, you know, you're training many, many different models, you know, and then you're going to say, well, which actual model in the end do I really want to use? So what you often do with empirical risk minimization is you know, you say, I do cross-validation, say temporal cross-validation, I figure out that this particular setting of the penalty term is the optimal thing to do. But then the question is, what do you do after that? Which, which data set do you use then to actually train your data? Do you go back and say, well, actually, I just use one of the, uh, the cross-validation data sets, which I which are for your training, or do you use all of your training data? You don't do a cross-validation split anymore, you just use all of your training data to retrain a new classifier with that optimal penalty uh, setting. It's, not, it's unclear, and there are different people you know, doing different things, so it's not, there's no sort of straightforward answer to that. Okay? So there's a conceptual lack of clarity there. This is another way to do things, and so uh, the Bayesian decision approach, which we did in graphical models, and you were done with the Gatsby if you didn't do graphical models. So in this case here, the whole point about the Bayesian decision approach is, is kind of, in some sense, orthogonal to the empirical risk thing. And the empirical risk thing, you say, 
basically you give up kind of approximating the, the data distribution. Just say it's the empirical distribution. It's kind of like you know, the simplest thing that you can do, and you and you focus on something else like the discriminant function. And here is the opposite. You say the only thing I care about is the data generating dis distribution, and the rest will be uh, will be automatic. So in this case, you're going to try to make a, a non-trivial distribution of p of uh, in this case the class and uh, the inputs. And there are two ways we can do that. So they're typically called the discriminative and the generative approach. So you could say, I oh, will split this modeling of this data in uh, the joint distribution C and X into either say a term P of C given X times by P of X, and I'll somehow fit both of these terms. So this would be the discriminative approach. Or you could say, do it the other way. You might say, well, I will split into P of X given C times by P of C, and that's the, that's the generative approach, because each uh, condition in each class, you're saying how is it generated, the data from that class, how is it generated. Okay, but each, both of these are part of the, the Bayesian decision procedure. So the kind of overview of this is a little bit different from empirical risk minimization. In this case here, we've got some um, X and C, and we have some parameters of the, which we're going to use to figure out what is the optimum uh, P of S and C uh, for what the proper parameters of that distribution. Okay, so there's some data fitting mechanism going on there. Then when we've got this distribution P of S given uh, C, we can, we can use that to directly form a classify P of C given X. Right? So if you've got a new input X star, You've already got the optimum uh, data model here, so you can use that to form P of C given the class, given X star and theta. So that's the whole, just, you know, Bayesian uh, mechanism there, just to turn that to whichever way, if you did this in a discriminative way, you've already got P of C given X directly. If you do it in a generative way, P of X, C, C, sorry, X given C times by P of C, sorry, yes, that's right, P of X given C times by P of C, you have to switch it around to baseball to get P of C given X. But either way, you've got direct access to this quantity here. Then, though, you still need to make a decision about which class you prefer to do. So depending on what your utility function is, if your utility function is, say, 0, 1 loss, you would just pick that class, which is the most likely one. But in general, you've got some loss function or some utility function. So you choose that, that C star, which give you, say, the, the minimal expected loss. That would be the Bayes optimal decision to do. Okay, so that would then be your optimal C star. Okay, so the only the only training in this case is is here, is learning this discriminant, uh, sorry, this um, data generating mechanism. This thing over here is is all done. It's, you don't touch that in principle. That is just something which your you know your uh, world is specifying how what the loss would be, and you don't. There's no training required. There. It's just a it's just an evaluation then of you know, usage of the of the, 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 gen, the distribution P of X and C in order to figure out what the optimal decision would be. So this is kind of very different from the empirical risk approach. Yeah, so these are the two, within this uh, Bayesian thing, these are the two mechanisms we could use. We could either use this, uh, this is the this is the generative approach, and this is the discriminative approach, but they're just different ways of parameterizing the same with the problem. So there are some advantages uh, within this Bayesian decision framework to doing, say, the generative approach. So in the generative approach, sometimes it's, uh, it's nice because you often have a lot of information about the structure of the problem, you know, what, it, what the faces look like. Maybe you have some idea about that. Um, the problem a little bit with the uh, generative approach is that sometimes it can be very difficult to make a good model, a generative model of complex data. You know, maybe you, you know, it's just really, really hard to do make uh, high dimensional uh, data models. So the discriminative approach, maybe that's a little bit better if you've got some kind of class boundary, which is relatively simple, even though that the the data distributions themselves are complex, but the boundaries are relatively straightforward. Maybe that's uh, a better thing to do. Um, but it's a little bit harder to incorporate your kind of prior knowledge into that approach. 
Anyway, so those, those are two sort of you know, uh, flavors of the Bayesian approach. So, but overall, the Bayesian kind of approach, and what are the, the benefits of this? Um, well, it's kind of conceptually clean, really, uh, I guess in the sense that you're just saying, you know, the only thing I'm really trying to do is just to model the way the data is generated, uh, P of X and C. And uh, everything else you do beyond, beyond that in order to make the decision is just defined by your loss or your, your, your utility function. So what happens there is we are totally separating the problem of, of learning something about the environment, P of X and C, from the ultimate decision. Right? We're not trying to say anything about uh, the kind of the kind of divorce from each other. We're just using the learned model to make the ultimate decision. Whereas remember in the other approach, in the empirical risk approach, the parameters of the model actually depend upon the, the, the risk function that you have, the, the loss function you have as well. Right? Whereas here they, they don't. Um, and certainly the decision, in principle, could be a very, very complex function of your, your, your inputs. It's really, you know, when you then, you, you've got this model P of C and X, and then compute the expected uh, utility, and then for a particular X star, the decision will be very, very, could in principle be a very complex, complex function of, the, of, the, of X, of X star. There's no, you know, there's no simple kind of formula to it. Now, so in this case, if you're happy with your loss function, that's just a user-defined thing, then this Bayesian approach is, is optimal if C, if your model of the um, P of X and C is, is true, if that's really the, uh, the truth, this is unbeatable, this approach. It's theoretically optimal. Okay. Uh, unfortunately, in practice, of course, it's not, you know, we, we, nev we never know if we've got the right uh, data generating mechanism. But this is a conceptual um, benefit. I'm not saying it's necessarily a practical benefit, but it's a conceptual benefit. Uh, drawbacks. So if you've got a poor model environment, so uh, you know, it's wrong, basically, all of your decisions are, in the end, you are going to be based upon this poor model of the environment. So uh, because you're essentially you know, you're, you're divorcing, you're separating the modeling of the environment from this ultimate use in terms of the decision you'll make, you could have a very poor model which will result in a very poor decision. Whereas in the empirical risk thing, you're actually modeling the decision itself directly. So typically you try to make, even if the model is not very powerful, you try to get the parameters of the model which give you the best ultimate decision. So that sort of more integrates the, the learning the parameters from which you ultimately are interested, which is good prediction performance. So to get around that, you know, sometimes people, you know, they sometimes uh, yeah, adjust these kind of Bayesian decision approach a little bit. So you may say, well, it's true. This is maybe the, the nicest thing the way to do it, but maybe there's some other parameters within this data generating mechanism which you can set by cross validation. And that would then have some effect of bringing into the parameter setting process something about the actual real usage ultimately of this data generating mechanism or data modeling mechanism. Yeah, I don't know if that's clear, but uh, that's, the, that's the sort of the high level uh, structure. So just to say, um, you know, so I, I'm, not, I'm not saying you should do one or the other. I'm just saying that these are, these are different things. These are different philosophies, the two major philosophies in, in machine learning. Um, I guess personally, I, you know, I focus more on the Bayesian thing, although I'm, I'm perfectly happy to, uh, if you wish, to use the one. That's, uh, that's no problem. Um, and certainly, there are cases where this Bayesian one uh, doesn't work well. So um, I remember doing a project where I had a very nice, uh, I thought, very nice approach, which um, was quite beautiful and very, uh, very uh, was quite difficult to implement, but I thought it was kind of uh, pretty cool actually. Um, the performance was terrible, absolutely terrible, and uh, so after some spending you know some significant time trying to understand how to improve it, uh, I just tried an, an empirical risk approach, and uh, in, you know within five minutes I'd already beaten the performance of the of the Bayesian thing. So. It's not necessarily the case that you know. Sometimes, for problems are so complex in, in reality that finding a, a good data generating mechanism or model is very very difficult to do. 
but maybe just you know going down a different empirical uh, risk minimization approach can be can sometimes give you some more, more satisfactory performance. Um, but the other the other thing is also true. So uh, for example, there are problems in you know in robotics or vision where you're not going to get very far just using an empirical risk minimization process. It doesn't work well, and you should use the, the prior knowledge about the environment, the way the world is structured, and you can build that in much more easily in this space and decision the, the, the theoretic approach. Okay, so but it's certainly something that when you when you think about you know which of these two, if you've got a particular problem, you know that there are, there exist two philosophical branches which you, you, know, you should perhaps explore both of them uh, for any particular problem. Okay, that's uh, that was the five minute intro to supervised learning. Just uh, so, any questions about that? Otherwise, I think we are pretty much done for today. Okay, so sorry, we're not done. We're almost done. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot to say. So you've all formed your teams now. Yeah.